Okay, good morning, folks. Go ahead and get going here. First off, anybody got anything they want to say? Okay, anybody got a question by anything? Yeah, Yuli, what's up? <laughs> How are you today? <laughs> I'm okay. Uh, yeah, doing okay. I'm, yeah, I'm downstate. I think you guys know that. I'm taking care of my mother after she had a heart attack and stroke. So it's pleasant down here. The birds are chirping and all that stuff. And Keon will be real proud of me. I'm going to I'm gonna do a garden. First time I've done a garden in a long, long, long time. So, uh, but anyway, and I hope you're well also. Um, okay, I think what we'll do then is, oh, I need to make sure everybody can hear me. Uh... Oh, can anyone not hear me? Okay, looks like we're good on that. So I'm going to share my screen. We'll take a look at Blackboard for a minute, and then we can get going. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Here we go. And... Had a couple things come up, so I sent out some announcements about. Um, well, the first deal was, and I think I mentioned this on Monday, maybe, I don't know. Depends on what, well, I think it was in the afternoon. So, anyway, I got an email about uh, their app. I think it's a map or a list, I don't know, one or the other, of Wi Fi hotspots. So, if you're having trouble, Getting connected, uh, this is uh, from Illinois government um, to do with people needing to, uh, uh, you know, online education, online classes, uh, being able to get connected. So uh, if you go to that link, they it tells me that, you know, it can help you find a, a, a spot if you're having a challenge on that. I think someone said they were trying to go to the parking lot over at Triton and it wasn't working for them too well. So anyway, this is another option. And then this next one, I got an email. Uh, I don't even know if it's this section or my, or my other section, my evening section. But anyway, someone was having trouble getting into the 16 homework. And um, I don't know what was up with that. Uh, but anyway, uh, I just wanted to go ahead and put the instructions out again. Uh, first off, the only way you can get to an assignment in Sapling is from the link in Blackboard. If you try to go directly to the Sapling uh, web page, uh, it will not let you in. It will say you're not registered for the class. And uh, the, the, the situation, I don't know if you guys remember or not, but part of the tuition for this class included your uh, your fees for using Sapling. So you did not have to uh, register and pay the money and all that stuff. It was a direct thing. So the only but the, because of that, the only way you can get the Sapling is from the link. I, I'll, I'll go back and look at that for just a second here. But anyway, uh, the instructions... Um, Go to Blackboard, go to Course Materials, go to Online Homework, Sapling, Homework, Chapter 16, uh, either Thermodynamics or Topic Introduction. <clears throat> and that should take you directly to either the homework or the topic introduction. And if it's not working after you do those steps, you need to let me, please, because then I have to uh, initiate a, a trouble ticket. I went ahead and emailed. Uh, Everyone I know at Sapling and also our tech guy at Triton about this, just in case 
there was something going on so they could uh, investigate because I know you, you guys don't have a lot of time. You know, semester is going to be up. So you need to have every opportunity to work on things. But anyway, the way it sh should be working is you come to Blackboard, click on Course Materials, scroll down a little bit, click on Online Homework. And then if you were trying to do Chapter 16 Thermodynamics, you should be able to click where it says Homework Chapter 13 Thermodynamics. Now, it won't work for me because I am currently in a student view, but I'm not really a student in the class, so it'll say I, I'm not registered, so that won't work. But it should work for you. Uh, the other announcement uh, was submitting lab reports. So, I don't know. Uh, again, I don't know if it's this section or another section, but for some reason, someone's having trouble being a laboratory. Uh, if this happens, you cannot email the report to me. You have to submit it through Blackboard. So therefore, we have to make this work. So here's how you submit a report, just in case someone is not familiar with that for some. You go to Blackboard, Course Materials, Lab Reports. Click on the title of the report. For instance, if it was Voltaic Cell Simulation, you'd click on that. You scroll down and click on where it says Browse My Computer. Navigate to the file with your report, click on open, and then you should see that attached. If there's some additional files, you just keep repeating that process until you have all your files attached. Then you click on submit, and then you and everyone in the group should get a confirmation email. Now, if that's not work, please let me know, and I'll have to talk to the Blackboard person because it was work. And just a quick demo that, click on Course Materials. It's going to look like this. You have to scroll down until you get to Lab Reports. Click on that. And then if you were trying to do the Voltaic Cells simulation, you would click on the title. It would look like this with the due date, the screen rubric, the instructions. You go down a bit further, it says Browse My Computer. You click on that, take you into the file system for your computer. So uh, you'd have to then navigate around within that to find it. And then once you do, you click on Open. It'll attach that file. If you got another file, you just do the whole thing again. When you get everything attached, then you scroll down here to the bottom and click on Submit, and then it will submit your report. So that should take care of those things. And I want to also flip over to sapling as far as assignments go. So the thermodynamics is due tomorrow evening. And um, I believe that we finished with chapter 16 thermodynamics. Uh, I'll ask that question in just a second here, but that's my that's my understanding. That's what I have here. So, uh, so anyway, I'm going to get out of sharing my screen and see if there's any questions. So now, are there any questions or comments about any of that stuff? Okay, I'm going to assume that you guys are able to submit lab reports and to get into the sapling homework. If something is not working, please let me know as soon as you can because you know, it's short. So then, um, at that, well, with that, we're going to go ahead and get started on. I want to go back and look at chapter 16 just for a second. So here's the title page, and we were working on, we did one worksheet that was mostly about this as far as uh, taking an enthalpy and an entropy and 
putting those into a Gibbs free energy equation in order to uh, interpret whether a reaction is spontaneous or not. And then we looked at free energies of formation. And these were similar to enthalpies of formation or entropies of formation. So we looked at a table like this of where um, the last column is the Gibbs free energies of formation. So that's to form anything on the list here. And then we have enthalpies of formation, same thing, to form any of those. And then in the middle was the entropies of formation. And then we used uh, the enthalpies of formation in this sort of calculation where we needed to know the Gibbs free energy of reaction for this reaction, the combustion of propane. So we were adding up the Gibbs free energy formation for the products, and then we were doing the same thing for the reactants, and we were subtracting the reactants from the products. And then we saw, or this was, first first line here was a review, really, that um, if you were trying to get the enthalpy for a reaction, so you need the delta H for a reaction. Then you would take the delta H of formations for um, all the products, subtract from that the enthalpies of formation for all the reactants. And again, the S it is not putting in the Greek sigma properly, so it's doing a capital S dead. So that's what it should be in all those locations. And then we saw that we could also do this to calculate the entropies for a reaction by taking the change entropy for the products and then subtracting from that the change in entropy for the reactants. And we completed a worksheet on that. And then our last slide was... Well, that's a good question. There should be. Yo, yeah, are you talking about this equation here? Okay. Well, I've got an N here and an N here, and I've got an M here and an M here. And the only reason they switched from N to M is to sort of illustrate that the N is for the products and the M is for the reactants. But in both cases, uh, those letters stand for the coefficients. Okay, yeah, that's what's going on. Thanks for asking. And then we had this last slide where the KEQ should have been at the end of the equation, but uh, collaborate did something weird to this. And the main thing here is there's a negative sign when we're comparing Gibbs free energy to the equilibrium constant. So this means that the interpretation of that is below it, that it's inversely related. Therefore, conditions that makes the free energy negative which is also to say that makes it spontaneous. Are also going to be the ones that are going to give you the largest equilibrium. Oops, sorry, I've got my. I'm trying to use my tablet and now it's going nuts. Um, and if we have a equilibrium constant. That is a large value, say, if it was equal to 100, then you could interpret that as the amount of the product would be 100 if the amount of the reactant were 1. So that means basically that in the equal 
equilibrium between reactant and product, that you're going to be, uh, you know, predominantly over on the right side because the P is going to be a lot bigger than the R. So has anybody got a question about this chapter before we start electrochemistry? Okay, looks like we're good there. So I'm going to put that away. And I'll put up the PowerPoint for electrochemistry. Now remember when you know when I'm sharing these that if you are having trouble seeing these, you can always go back into Blackboard and put the same presentation now it's not going to be this you know it's not going to be as good because you're not going to have me scribbling all over it in some you know way that you can't understand but no no it should be better with me writing on them i think uh, so anyway we'll, we'll go to that now well maybe not Electric cam. Oh yeah, forgot to push the button. So here is our electric chemistry chapter, chapter seventeen. Mm, looks better that way. And um, so starting out, there's different applications of electric chemistry but one that's important nowadays is battery technology because battery technology is necessary to enable other technologies uh, a lot of times they talk about enabling technologies things that you have to have in order to do these other things so for instance, an electric car, electric tools, small electronics, this thing's way out of date, that picture. Uh, a lot of medical devices are, you know, have a battery in them. Um, calculators have been around for a long time. Your laptop computer, if you have one. So electrochemistry is important in order to have the best uh, power to weight ratio. That is a big uh, concern with batteries is how much power can you have for the weight of the battery? Because, you know, if your Tesla weighs five tons, I don't care how great the battery is, that's just not going to go. So you've got to have, <clears throat> excuse me, lightweight, efficient batteries in order to enable those kinds of products. Now, electrochemistry also applies even to things such as uh, physiology uh, in the uh, action of nerves, uh, action potential uh, in muscles. Uh, it's still a, an electrochemical phenomenon, so, uh, or well, it's similar anyway. It's a, it's a concentration gradient kind of phenomenon, but it's very similar. Okay, um, let's go to the next slide. So to start this out, going back to uh, Chem 140, we studied oxidation reduction reactions. An example of one would be if you had a solution like this, silver nitrate, and then you had a solid piece of copper. So our solid copper is there, and our solution of silver nitrate is over there. <clears throat> and we're also expressing those in our chemical reaction down below here. So when we first put the wire, the copper wire, in the solution, it's going to look like this. The copper wire starts to change color pretty quickly. That's because of the deposition of silver on the outside of the wire. And then at the end, then on the product side here, 
we now have silver solid on the outside of the copper wire. Now, some of the, the, the copper is an excess, so there's still going to be copper remaining on the inside of that shell of silver, but the outside of the wire will have silver around it. And then uh, the solution will be changed into a copper nitrate solution, which has this green color. So that's why when we're looking at this, we see that the color changes. We started out colorless over here with silver nitrate. We end up with a green color or copper nitrate. Now, uh, you see here that we've got something called a reducing agent, an oxidizing agent. You heard about that in Chem 140, but that has been a while. So let's go back and examine what's going on here. So we have copper solid, and we're going to react that with silver cation. So I'm taking that. Um, out of my reaction down here. I'm just basically going to net ionic equation. And so then what's going to end up on the other side then is now going to be copper as part of a uh, ionic compound. That's copper 2 plus. And then now you're going to have silver solid. So I'm just taking the reaction down here and I'm writing it as a net ionic equation. We can then take these two reactions and break them out into uh, what's called half reactions. Now I'm going to need to clear the board here because this is getting kind of busy. So here we go. So I'm going to do just the copper. Whoops, my marker quit. I'm going to do just the copper part. So copper solid is going to become then copper 2 plus plus two electrons. Okay. Now, hopefully you remember from when you had this in Chem 140 that when you lose an electron, That that's called an oxidation. That's the oxidation part of the oxidation reduction reaction. <laughs> then the uh, silver cation, there's two of those because there's two silver nitrates, so that's 2Ag plus that will react with uh, two electrons. And that will become then um, two silver solids. So that's the gaining of electrons that process is and when we gain an electron it's called a reduction and you've probably heard the uh, acronym or not really an acronym but the monomic that's what it's called uh, to to recall this so that one is oil rig meaning oxidation is loss of electrons reduction is gain of electrons pretty corny way to remember it but if it works who cares so now um oh i should point out that the two electrons up here are going to become the two electrons in the reduction. 
You cannot have a reduction if you don't have an oxidation. But also, you can't have an oxidation if you don't have a reduction. The electrons have to go somewhere. You could not just have something oxidized with no place for the electrons to go. So now, to answer our question down here that you might have, is how do we know that the copper is the reducing agent? Well, it's the source of the electrons. Up here, the copper, oops, the copper lost electrons, enabling the silver to be ox or to be reduced. So therefore, it is the reducing agent. And the silver part of the silver nitrate oxidizing agent because it is essentially Ag uh, plus so that's a place for the electrons to go so that makes it the oxidizing agent now you could just say whatever was oxidized is the reducing agent and whatever is reduced is the oxidizing agent. And that's okay, you know. Um, so if you just memorize that, it'll work also. But you do need to be able to take a oxidation reduction reaction. First off, identify that it is an oxidation reduction uh, reaction. And then, uh, figure out what got oxidized, what got reduced, and what is the reducing agent and what is the oxidizing agent. So before I move on, has anybody got a question on that? Okay. So some more on basically that same subject. And that is oxidation numbers. So oxidation numbers is a way to see, first off, is it an oxidation reduction reaction? Because that's your first question really that you're dealing with is, is it redox or reduction or oxidation reduction? Because if it's not, then the rest of this is not relevant. And then the next part is figuring out then where the reduction is, where the oxidation is, and then you know from that you'll know what is the oxidizing agent and what is the reducing agent. So this all involves a number line like you can see here. Negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, positive one, positive two, positive three. And if we go from the right to the left in the numbers, then that is a reduction. Or if we go the opposite direction from the left to the right, then that's going to be an oxidation. So if we can assign these numbers, you know, the negative, the negative numbers, the zero, positives, and all that, if we can assign those to uh, various substances in a reaction, we can then track them from the uh, reactant side over to the product side. And we can see how they change. And by seeing how they change, we know whether something is oxidized or reduced. So down here, we've got a magnesium solid. And we're going to see on the next slide how we come up with oxidation numbers. You guys did this in Chem 140. But basically, something that is in its elemental form, in its normal form that we would find it in the world, then it gets an oxidation number of zero. And then if it is a ion, such as a cation, so this would be, oops, I keep pushing a button on my tablet pen. 
Okay, that's manganese 2 plus or magnesium 2 plus. Then that charge is going to give you your oxidation number, the plus 2. So we're going from a 0 to plus 2. So that is up here, going from 0 to plus 2. So that's definitely an oxidation. Now let's then look at the other part of this. That would be the hydrogen. The hydrogen is a hydrogen ion. It's H plus. So because of that, it's oxidation number. Wow, my pen just went crazy. Help me. Anyway, it went, it's going from a plus one to over here, hydrogen is H2 gas. So that's its atomic form. Hydrogen gas, in the world that we're in, we would find it as a diatomic H2, and we'd also find it as a gas. So therefore, its oxidation number is going to be zero. So now we're going from plus one over to zero. So that's, if we go to the top of the screen, we're going from plus one to zero. You only have to move that far for it to be a change, plus one to zero. And so since we're moving from right to left, it's a reduction. So the blue line down here is a reduction. So since we've identified an oxidation and a reduction, we know this is a oxidation reduction or redox uh, reaction. We know which part is the oxidation, which part is a reduction. And then from that, we would know what is the reducing agent and what is the oxidizing agent. So I'll stop again and ask, is there a question? Because a lot of times, electrochemistry is confusing. I thought it was confusing the first time I hit it. Okay, then. We'll go to this next slide. So this is the rules for doing oxidation numbers. And some of the rules are much more important than others. Um, first one is elements that are in their elemental form are going to have an oxidation number of zero. So things like O2. into iron solid f e solid that's the way we normally find those so that's going to be uh, you know carbon solid so those are all going to have an oxidation number of zero the next line here the oxidation number of a monatomic single atom, in other words, ion, is the same as this charge. So that's going to be things like, say, sodium cation, Na plus, is going to have a plus one oxidation number, or chloride, Cl negative then it's going to have a negative one oxidation number. Okay, everybody good? Got a question? Then what we're going to see next is everything else is going to revolve around two kinds of atoms, oxygen and hydrogen. They're going to really be setting or dictating what the other atoms are going to be. And here's how that works. Oxygen is going to have a oxidation number of negative 2 
if it is in a compound. And it does not matter if that compound is ionic or covalent. If it's in a compound, its oxidation number is going to be negative 2. Unless, okay, there's always that exception, it is a peroxide. If it's a peroxide, then its oxidation number is going to be negative 1. But most cases, that's not going to, oh, it's going crazy. Yeah. Anyway, um, so most of the time, oxygen is going to be negative 2 unless it happens to be in its uh, elemental form. So oxygen in its elemental form is O2. Its oxidation number is going to be 0. Oxygen in a compound is going to be negative 2 unless it is peroxide. Okay, let's go to the, the other element that pretty much dictates how everything, what oxidation numbers they will have. If the hydrogen is bonded to a metal, that would be something like sodium hydride. So NaH then the hydrogen is going to be negative 1. On the other hand, if it's bonded to a nonmetal, such as hydrogen chloride, HCl, or hydrochloric acid, either one, the hydrogen is going to be plus 1. Then the other two pieces of this is if you're trying to figure out the oxidation numbers in a compound, then if you add all the oxidation numbers up for every atom in the compound, the total should be zero. If it's a polyatomic ion that you're trying to figure this out for, then the sum of all the oxidation numbers is going to be the same as the charge of the ion. So now has anybody got a question on doing that? Okay, what I want to do now is we're going to we're going to stop this. But remember you can go back and look at this by going to the uh, the presentations. In fact, let me Remind everybody of how that works. Share my screen. Okay, if you want to see the same PowerPoint, you just click over onto your tab in your browser that's got a blackboard there. Click on Course Materials. Click on Lecture Presentations. And then scroll down some. And then click on Lecture History. And then you can click on either one of these. It doesn't really not matter much. But anyway, if you click on the first one, that's the PDF of it. And it'll take a moment to load. So here it is. And we were on the oxidation number slide. So if you know you'll probably need to see this while we're doing a worksheet on oxidation numbers. Okay, so that's how you get there. I'm gonna go back and stop sharing my screen. And instead, wanna go to the worksheet. Oh, I'm sorry, I do need to go back to share my screen. I need to show you guys where the worksheets are. Okay, to go to the worksheet, you go to Course Material. Scroll down some, click on Worksheets, and then go down to the one for Electrochemistry, click on that. 
we're doing the one oxidation numbers. You can click here. And, oh, is this not? Oh, okay, we're good. <laughs> there for a second, I thought I'd put the key in here. Um, okay, so anyway, this is the worksheet we're going to be doing, okay? So if you want to look at it over in Blackboard, that's where it's located. Okay, now I'll stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to put up the uh, worksheet. Now, we're not going to do this one as a group. We're going to, you know, it's every person for themselves. <laughs> Um, so what we're going to do is I'm just going to call on people. Okay. So now's the time to take one more sip of coffee and, you know, totally wake up. <laughs> okay. So, uh, give me a second to make sure I've got everybody recorded this here today. Oh, this is going to take a second. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do basically is this, we'll just go down the worksheet here. So um, I need to make this a little bit bigger, I think. So hopefully you guys can see this. So for this first one, we've got CL2. So uh, we're going to need the oxidation number for CL2. Um, so I'm going to just use my phone with my attendance app to randomly call on you guys. So first up is Sergio. What's the oxidation number for the chlorine in a molecule of Cl2? Just put it in text or whatever. Thank you, sir. Does anyone disagree with that, that it's going to be zero? Hopefully not, because you know that chlorine is another one of the diatomics. So in its elemental form, it's going to be Cl2. So now for our next one, we've got a chloride, and we need to know what is the Oxidation number for the chlorine atom in chloride. So, uh, Damien, what do you think? Thank you, sir. He says negative one. Anybody disagree with that? Okay, looks like we're good. Noah, what's the oxidation number for a sodium atom in a sodium atom? Thank you, sir. Anybody disagree with that one? So our next one is a sodium ion. So that's a sodium cation. It has one positive charge. Molly, what do you think the oxidation number would be? Okay, plus one, thank you. Okay, I know this is kind of boring right at the moment here, so I'm going to jump ahead. So next thing we've got is oxygen O2. It's a diatomic, so that's in its elemental form, so its oxidation number is going to be zero. Next thing we got is nitrogen N2. That's its elemental form. Its oxidation number is going to be zero. 
Then we have an aluminum cation. It's it's uh, plus three. So uh, its oxidation number is going to be uh, plus three. I know that a lot of times you see these things, you know, plus three, three plus. It doesn't matter. I mean, it, it technically it does it it does matter, but I'm certainly not concerned about anything like that. Okay, let's scroll down some more. So this next one here, we're to water. So now things are going to start to get a little more interesting. So we're looking at the hydrogen atoms in water and the oxygen atom in water. So I'm going to ask somebody what they think the oxidation number is going to be for oxygen in water. So Clarissa, what do you think the oxidation number is going to be? Oh, uh, <laughs> hi. Uh, I, I was asking, what do you think the oxidation number is going to be for the oxygen? So we're trying to, we're going to do this one first. What do you think the oxygen is going to be? Negative two. Does anybody disagree with that? Now, it goes with the rules we had. We said that oxygen in a compound, whether it's ionic or covalent, it doesn't matter. It's going to be negative two unless it happens to be a peroxide. Okay, so that's, that's definitely the answer. Now, I'm going to ask somebody, what is the oxidation number for one of the hydrogen atoms in water? So, Muhammad, what would the oxidation number be for a hydrogen in water? He says plus one. Okay, does anybody disagree with that? Not seeing anything. Okay, so just, you know, here's a quick thing. You got two hydrogen atoms. Each of those is plus one. So that's going to equal plus two. And then you've got an oxygen that is negative two. So that the plus two and the negative two are going to balance each other out. And overall, the oxidation value for water is going to be zero. That's what we want to have happen. Has anybody got a question on what I was just saying? Okay, that's an example of a compound. Now, this next one, number nine, that's a polyatomic ion. There is a negative sign there. It is really small, so it's kind of hard to see. But anyway, we're going to do this one next. That's a nitrate. It's, got, it, it's the polyatomic ion that has one negative charge. So I'm going to ask someone for what they think the oxidation number is going to be for the oxygen. So, Keon, what do you think it's going to be? Two negative. Okay. Anybody disagree? So that is correct. That's what the oxidation number is for one of the oxidate for one of the oxygen atoms in the nitrate. Now there are three of them, but that's what it is for one of them. 
So the next thing we need to come up with is what's the value for the nitrogen? So I'm going to ask someone for that. Aureli, what do you think the oxidation number is going to be for the nitrogen then in our nitrate? Plus one, she says. Does anybody disagree with that? So, so everyone thinks that the nitrogen ought to be plus one. Is that? Oh, no, Molly says not. Oh, man, you guys are in the same group. Oh. Okay. Um, well, let's think about this for a sec. You've got, hey, Mosin is saying plus five. Oh, we got, we got a run here of group four. Um, so hold that thought a sec. So you've got three of those oxygens in there. So three times are two negative is going to make six negative, correct? And what we want to end up with is one negative. So as to match the charge on our polyatomic ion. So what is, what positive value are we going to need to end up with negative one? And Bozina had it correct. She said five positive, because if you combine six negative with five positive, you're going to end up with one negative. So that would be your answer then, is uh, instead of plus one, let's make it plus five. There we go. Oh, you're certainly welcome. Now, is everybody, is, has anybody got a question on how we got those? Okay, screen's getting a little busy, so I'm going to have to erase here. Okay, the next one up was the nitrogen dioxide. I'm just going to do it. The oxygen is going to be neg. Oops, I got to get the marker going. Come on. Okay, the oxygen is going to be negative two. Since there's two, uh, two oxygens in nitrogen dioxide, then the nitrogen is going to have to be plus four for this to end up with a total of zero. Does anybody not see that or have a question? Okay, this next one. The dichromate anion. It's a bit of a challenge. So let's do that one. I'm going to ask somebody for what they think the oxidation number is going to be for one of the oxygen atoms in dichromium or dichromate. Well, I'll get it right in a second. Dichromate. So let's call on somebody. Bozina, what do you think the oxygen is going to be, please, in the dichromate?
Yes, it was you. She says, plus six. Well, okay, let's consider this. Up here in water, the oxygen was negative two. In the nitrate, the oxygen was negative two. In the nitrogen dioxide, the oxygen was negative two. Are you sure you want to stick with plus six for the oxygen? Not to chromate, the oxygen. Yeah, no, no, you want negative, yeah, 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 there you go. So she's going to go with, see, I, I was able to influence her by saying everyone else is that way. Well, that'll get you in trouble right now. That's okay. You, you know, I'm sitting here drinking my coffee. Um, so now we need to figure out what the chromate's going to be. So I'll ask somebody for what they think the chromate is. So, Yulia, what do you think the chromate is in the dichromate polyatomic ion? She says, plus six. Does anybody disagree or does anybody want an explanation of this? Okay, so since no one's asking for one, I think you guys have got it. So I'm not going to, oops, yes, please. Okay, let's do that then. So you've got seven oxygen. So that's seven times negative two. So that'll be equal to negative 14. Now we want to end up with this being uh, two negative. So I'll put this down here. So for it to become too negative, then the chromate is going to have to, all the chrome, the two chromates together is going to have to add up to 12, right? If you take negative 14, combine that with positive 12, you're going to be left with negative 2. So now we have plus 12, but we have two chromates. So if we divide it by two, then we're going to have plus six. And then, you know, if we're not really sure that made sense, take two times plus six. And that would be equal to plus 12. And again, if we take negative 14 that we had for the oxygens, put it with the positive 12 for the chromates, those together are going to give us negative 2. And that's what we're trying to achieve. Now, does anybody have a question on that? So, you're welcome. So, the process. Take oxygen and make it negative 2, unless it is a peroxide. That's your first thing. Then, if the oxygens are negative 2, the other atom will become whatever it has to be. If we go through this entire worksheet, you'll see that, for instance, nitrogen can go from positive numbers, very positive, like plus five, can go from that to very negative numbers. So nitrogen just becomes whatever it has to be to fit in. It's like your friends, you know, they just become whatever they have to be to fit in. I just want to fit in. Anyhow, it's a joke. Um, I don't really think we need to go through and do all of these. Uh, it's good practice, though, for you guys. But, uh, you know, I think we spend our time on some other things because we are 
running a little short, but there is two I want to focus in on. And that is our two peroxides. Sorry about my phone beeping in your ear. Um, and that is this compound here, Na2O2 and H2O2. Those are our two peroxides. But you might be saying, well, how do I know they're peroxides? Well, if we take the Na2O2, we know that we can tell that sodium has to be a cation, and the only kind of cation it could be is Na+. It's in that first column the periodic table. By this point, after taking two chemistry classes, it's been kind of ground into your head that it's going to have to be one positive charge. Since, since there's two of those, then the oxygens are going to have to be negative one. For that to balance out. So therefore, that compound, uh, that it, that compound is sodium peroxide. So you don't really have to memorize it. You can just figure it out from the formula. And then for the H2O2, hopefully you guys recognize that one as being hydrogen peroxide. An important compound right now. If you have something that you're trying to start to, to um, kill the bugs on, for some reason I can't say the right word today, hydrogen peroxide is a lot better option if it's going to be something that you're going to be uh, consuming later or something like that. Because the hydrogen peroxide is going to produce oxygen. Once it's done that, it's water. It's just going to become water. So much safer than, say, isopropyl alcohol. So something to consider in our current world. Hydrogen peroxide is your friend. Now the trick is just finding it someplace. So anyway, on the rest of these, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it to you guys to work through these. But you do need to be able to get the oxidation numbers for uh, different compounds. Oh, somebody said something, looks like. Can you drink it? No, don't drink hydrogen peroxide. Oh, somebody's saying you can. <laughs> no, you can't, man. Don't do it. Don't do it. It can it can cause some some scarring, and you don't want scarring in your esophagus. That can be a real problem eventually. So no, don't drink it. You can brush your teeth with it, but be sure you rinse. And I don't think that's probably a fabulous idea anyway. Okay. Yeah, just want yeah yeah. I, I wouldn't drink it. No. You you'll find somebody on the internet telling you to do it but you know they're wrong um okay so like on this thing we're gonna we're gonna drop out of this now uh, i would like for you guys to go ahead and work on this can we go over one of the last ones with the three elements sure let's do it okay what would be our best one here um they're all about the same, so. Okay, uh, we'll just do the first one. So that first one there, that's uh, sulfuric acid, H2SO4. So, Yulia, what do you think the oxygen is going to be in that one? Negative 2. And then what do you think the hydrogen is going to be in that one? Plus one. See, that's the, that's the approach to this. We, we know that oxygen and hydrogen is always going to be 
certain numbers. So, you know, the oxygen is going to be, if it's O2, it's going to be zero. If it's anything else, if it's part of a compound, it's going to be negative two, unless it's a peroxide. And then for hydrogen, if it is with a metal, then it's going to be negative one. If it's with a non-metal, then it's going to be plus one. So those are easy to get. The sulfur is going to be whatever it needs to be so that when you combine everything together, you end up at zero. So I've got here, let me get my tablet going. You've got two hydrogens, so two times plus one is going to be plus two, correct? And then you've got um, four oxygens, so four times negative two is going to be negative eight. So now the sulfur is going to be whatever it needs to be so that it's to end up at zero. So we've got plus two here. We have negative eight there. So what would sulfur have to be? Yeah, plus six. Because then if it's plus six and you combine it with those other two, you're going to end up at zero, and that is the objective here, is to end up at zero. Okay? You betcha. Okay, I'm going to kill this. Let's see, how's our time? Yeah, we're doing good. And we'll go back to the PowerPoint. Ooh, that's big. <laughs> okay. So we just finished this this up, the oxidation numbers. So now we're about ready to actually go into um, what is actually electrochemistry. Everything up to this point has been kind of a review. Uh, but I want to step back for just a moment to this slide and point out something here. Oops, get my marker. That this entire reaction is occurring in one container. Right? Oop, one container. But remember, we said there's two halves, there are two halves to this reaction. One is copper becoming copper 2 plus plus two electrons. The other one is two of these silvers. So each one is one positive charge becoming silver solid. Oh yeah, I put in the two electrons out here though in order to do that. So there's two reactions really happening. There is a copper solid becoming, I left the solid on. There's copper solid becoming copper two plus and there's 
silver cation becoming silver solid. Two reactions, one container. If we split these into two containers, we can then produce our electrons in one container and we can use those electrons in the other container. And whoever it was that thought of this first, they came up with a, a technological application of this reaction. That was the, essentially the first battery. Actually, a battery means it's a group of cells. So what they came up with initially was the first cell. Okay, so now let's go to our next slide where we're doing that exact thing. So here, notice that what we have here is a piece of copper metal. And in our solution, we have copper two plus cations, just like we did before, except everything was in that soup. Everything was in one container. Now it's in two different containers. And then on my other side here, I have a solid piece of silver and I have silver cations. So I've separated these from each other. Now we did our, uh, our uh, voltaic cell uh, experiment. So you guys have already done this really, but and it might have been better if you'd have seen this first, but hey, it's not that far apart. So now what's happening on the left side in the way this is set up is that we have the oxidation. We have the copper becoming the copper cation, like it shows us down here. And where there is an oxidation that has a particular name, and that is the anode or it's the anodic half cell. So yeah, you need a way to remember that. And here is a possibility. Both words start with a vowel, right? Because on the other side where we have our reduction happening, that's called the cathode or the cathodic uh, half cell. And those both have a consonant. So they're not starting with a vowel. So that's one way of keeping it straight what goes with what. Now the other piece of this is to note that where the oxidation is occurring is where we're making electrons. And those electrons are flowing from one electrode to the other. However, that can't happen unless we can keep the ions in balance. So down here, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna erase so I don't have so much clutter. I'm producing Get this going. I think I'll change colors too. There we go. Okay, I am producing copper two plus cation. If you imagine that coming up against this porous plug, that's in one end of the glass tube that connects the two beakers together. If you imagine that two plus cation coming up against it, then it's going to force the sodium cation to move and congregate on the other side of this glass tube. Okay. So now that's gonna cause the silver, positive silver cation to be pushed, so to speak, over to the silver electrode. So in other words, we've got a negative flow 
going clockwise around the cell and we've got a positive flow for the cations going in a counterclockwise flow going in the opposite direction and that keeps everything in balance and if that was not if that was not there then this would not work we cannot just let electrons pile up someplace and we cannot let ions pile up we have to have a way for them to move you might remember when we were talking about conductivity uh, in chem 140 I don't think we've talked about it in chem 141 and we said that you the best way if you want to get rid of your significant other is you buy them some bath some bath uh, salts you know or just some sodium chloride and you throw it in the bathtub and then toss in the toaster and it works much better than if you put in sugar because sugar is not going to conduct it doesn't make ions you need something that is going to make ions in order to conduct electricity and the same is going on here I hope you guys are laughing at home at my bath salts and toasters but anyway okay so um, one more thing here and that is this num oops this number at the top there on our voltmeter well one more time okay there we go our voltmeter here at the top it's got a positive value we need to have a positive value for a electrochemical cell to be spontaneous and when we're saying that it's spontaneous that also is said in these two words voltaic or galvanic voltaic or galvanic means that it is a spontaneous cell and for it to be spontaneous then our potential should be positive positive. and when you were doing your experiment on Monday I think I've got that right. It is, yeah, it is the one we did, I believe. Um, that um, it all depends on how you hook the voltmeter up. If you hook the negative and the positive connections backwards, then you'll get the opposite sign. So that's that's the tricky part. But anyway, it should be a positive value. And when we calculate what that value should be it will definitely be a positive value now this picture that we're looking at currently you need to be able to label something like this if you see it in the future so you're going to need to know um, what's the anodic half cell or the anode and the oxidation what is the cathodic or the reduction how do the electrons flow how do the positive ions flow and I think that's it so that's basically you, you need to be able to do those kind of uh, those kinds of labeling Okay, let's go to our next slide here. Well, wait a minute. Does anybody have a question before we go anywhere else? Okay, not seeing anything. Let's go to the next one then. So this is just emphasizing that the salt bridge maintains a charge balance in the cell. That the positive...
ions are all moving in that sort of direction. So counterclockwise around this circuit, or you could say they're the positive charges are moving from left to right in the salt bridge. Or the definition of a salt bridge, it's what maintains the charge balance of the cell. So what we're going to be doing from here on is uh, looking at different examples of uh, voltaic cells. We're going to be changing out uh, some of the materials and we're going to be seeing how that affects things. So for this next one, um, we now have a uh, well, totally different combination going on here. Uh, on the anode cell, where the oxidation is, we now have a piece of magnesium. So this is magnesium metal that's in this coil. And so that's going to be producing magnesium cations in the solution. And it's going to be releasing electrons. So those electrons are going to be flowing from left to right. The magnesium or the yeah, the cations, the positive charge is going to be going in what is the opposite direction around the circuit. On the other side, we don't actually have a metal. There, there's no uh, reduction of a metal occurring on the other side. Instead, what we have happening is hydrogen ions that are in the water, because remember water auto-ionizes, those hydrogen ions are going to pick up an electron. It's, a, it's one of the two electrons produced when we oxidize the magnesium. And um, that's going to make hydrogen gas. And of course, for that to be true, you'd need two of the hydrogen cations, and we'd need two of the electrons. So that's what's happening over here on the cathode, or the reduction side, is that H plus in the water, we actually have hydrochloric acid added in there, but there would still be some H plus just because it's water. Anyway, that will pick up an electron and it'll become H2 gas. And it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but there are some bubbles right here. And that's going to be our H2 gas being released. So the electrode this time is a platinum wire. And it says it's non-reactive. So the platinum is not changing. The platinum is not doing anything like losing electrons. It's not becoming anything like uh, platinum plus So that's not happening. And it's not going the opposite direction. It's not that platinum plus, there's none of that in the solution. Uh, that's not becoming platinum solid. So it's not that kind of a reaction like we had on the previous slide. The platinum is just a way for the electrons to get into the solution in order to then be able to reduce the hydrogen ions. Okay, anybody got a question about that? So now let's talk about what we see here at the bottom of the page, because this is an important idea and you need to be able to do this. So. I'm going to erase all this stuff so that we can focus on what we have at the bottom here. This is a way what we oops, what we have at the bottom here 
is a way to communicate this cell. So here's how this is going to work. We start with the, uh, the anode. So that's the magnesium. So that's magnesium solid. And then we're moving then the opposite direction from the flow of the electrons. We're going from magnesium solid to the magnesium cation. You can see this got the reaction down here to the magnesium two plus. So there's magnesium two plus in the solution. So that's the next piece you see in this shorthand version of our cell. And we have a vertical line. What the vertical line is illustrating is that we're moving from a solid to an aqueous solution. So we're changing phases. We're going from solid to aqueous solution. You then have this double line. The double line is indicating the salt bridge. So you've got one barrier at the one end of the salt bridge. You have another barrier at the other end of the salt bridge because you're going from aqueous solution to salt bridge back to another aqueous solution. Now we're on the cathode side where you have hydrogen ions. So that's why we're seeing that. And then the hydrogen ions are getting converted into H2 gas. So that's why we have H2 gas next. And since aqueous is a different phase than gas, then you have to have another vertical line. And then finally, we have our platinum wire electrode. That's this part here. And again, because you're going from a gas to a solid, you need another vertical line. So what we have at the bottom is representing what's in the picture above. So you should be able to go from the shorthand version to the picture, the diagram of the, of the cell, or from the picture to the shorthand. So does anybody have a question on how to do that? Okay, let's go to the next slide then. So we're now going to go to something called a standard hydrogen electrode. And the reason why we, we, we talk about this, the reason why there is such a thing as a hydrogen electrode is if we go back a couple slides to here, the positive 0.46 volts that we're getting on the voltmeter, part of that is coming from the, the uh, copper and the copper 2 plus. And then part of it, part of the 0.46, is coming from the cathode, where we've got the solid silver and the silver cation. So we don't know what part of the positive 0.46 is coming from the copper and what part is coming from the silver. But we know part is coming from one, part is coming from the other. 
and you can't just measure one of these. You can't just measure one side. You can't say, oh, I'm going to measure the copper or I'm going to measure the silver. You can't do that. You always have to have the two halves of the cell. So that's where the hydrogen electrode comes in. With a hydrogen electrode, it is defined that its potential is zero. Therefore, whatever you see on your voltmeter, you know, if we have a voltmeter up here, some number volts going to the rest of the voltaic cell arrangement, then whatever number we're getting up there is just because of the other half cell. Because we've defined that the side that has hydrogen ion and hydrogen gas, that its potential is going to be zero. So any number we read on a voltmeter is just due to the other electrode. And they're showing us here, you know, what's going on. Um, this again has a platinum non-reactive inert electrode. So there's no platinum ions involved or anything like that. The platinum is just a way for electrons to either move into the solution or to leave the solution. So over on right here, we've got a picture of what's going on that we have a H plus cation, hydrogen ion coming in, and it's picking up an electron. So the electrons are flowing in this direction, and we're releasing hydrogen gas. But what they're showing us below here, so this down at the bottom part, this can also happen in reverse. Hydrogen gas can come up to the electrode, give up an electron, and become H+. So you can have either a reduction or an oxidation, either one, uh, with a hydrogen electrode. It'll just go whichever way it needs to go to either supply electrons to the other electrode or to take electrons from the other electrode. So it can go either way. It can be a reduction or it can be an oxidation. Anybody got a question? So let's move on some, and we're going to use our hydrogen electrode. So we've got our hydrogen electrode here, and it's going to be, this time, it's going to be an oxidation. So it's going to be the anode. And on the other side, we have a copper electrode, like we started out with. And we've got copper 2 plus cation. And we're going to have an oxidation at the hydrogen electrode. So you can see that we have electrons that are flowing from left to right. And those electrons are going to get with the copper. So that's the reaction we have here at the bottom. The electrons are going to get with the copper 2 plus cation. So there's the electrons. And it's going to produce copper solid. And you know, we have a salt bridge, and that's maintaining our charge balance. You know, the positives are moving to the right through the salt bridge to keep things in balance. And when we hook this up to do the experiment, we get a positive 0.337. Since we said that the potential of the hydrogen electrode is zero, then we can 
we can we can consider all of that the point the positive point three three seven volts to be just because of the copper none of that number is coming from the hydrogen electrode because its potential is zero now i'm going to come back to the shorthand down here in just a minute but i want to jump over to this next slide but keep in mind what you're seeing here in this case we've got the uh, we've got a uh, an oxidation occurring at our hydrogen electrode so now on this one we're going to have um, we're going to do this versus silver so again the hydrogen electrode is going to be the oxidation the electrons are flowing from left to right okay this time on the right side we've got a silver electrode so that reaction is down here at the bottom silver cation that is down in the solution It's going to get an electron from the wire and it's going to become silver solid. The reading on the voltmeter is positive 0.8, so therefore that is the potential that we can assign to this electrode. Okay, so we got these two numbers one for the one for the copper, one for the silver. In both cases, these are reductions of the metal ion. Now, remember, we started out with copper and silver. We're going to be getting back to that again. And what we're going to see is in that voltaic cell we started with, one of those is going to be the oxidation but the other one is going to be the reduction before we do that let's make sure that we can do the shorthand of these things so we're starting out here on the on the anode side with the platinum solid electrode we then have hydrogen gas so since it's two different phases gas and solid there's a vertical line. Then it's going to, the hydrogen gas is going to be uh, uh, it's, it's going to be producing the H plus cation, the hydrogen ion. So that's our next thing we have. And since it's a gas and it's an aqueous solution, you got a vertical line. Then we're to the salt bridge. So that's why we have the double line. Then we get to the copper two plus cation. So that's right here. And then we have the solid copper electrode that's here. And since there's aqueous and solid, those are different. So we've got a vertical line. So that's how you write that. And the next slide, same kind of thing. So I'm not going to go through that one. Okay, we got a couple more points and we'll pull all this together, I hope. So, um, next slide here. For these potentials that we're measuring with our hydrogen electrode, if they're going to be standard values, if they're going to be ones that everybody's going to get, then there's two requirements. One is that the concentrations have to be one molar, and the other is the temperature has to be room temperature 25 C so those two are important and we're going to see that later on but for right now one molar 25 C now people have been working on electrochemical experiments for a long 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 time so there's lots of data out there and this is a chart of the potentials versus a hydrogen electrode for a lot of different reactions. And um, 
we've got some interpretation of what those numbers are. I don't want to do that right now. I want to come, I want to come back to that later. Instead, I want to take our two values that we got for our copper and our silver and see what we can do with that. So we'll come back to some of the rest of the information on this slide a little bit later. So this is our cell potential equation. Won't be given, you guys will have to remember it. But the idea is that you take whatever is the reduction potential. So reduction is always going to be some kind of a metal cation. It's going to have different charges, so it just depends on what particular metal it is. But we're going to take that metal, and let's say it's got one positive charge. We're going to put one electron with it so that we then produce metal solid. Okay? So in both cases, these are going to be reduction potentials. We take the potential for the cathode. We take the potential for the anode. We subtract the anode from the cathode. But now if we don't know which one is the cathode and the anode, that can be a challenge. We're going to be doing that on a worksheet in just a little bit. Again, I'm going to do some skipping ahead, and we'll come back and hit this in a little bit more uh, methodical way. But anyhow, if I use the correct anode and cathode, I'm going to get this. I'm going to have 0.8. You remember we measured 0.8 against a half cell or against a hydrogen electrode. And then we're going to use 0.337. That was the value we got when we measured the other electrode against a hydrogen electrode and then we get the 0.463. So that was the number that we got to start out with, 0.46. So we see some of that's coming from one side, some of that's coming from the other. Okay. So what this is showing us is if we if we switch these out, if we switch the anode and cathode, we won't get a positive value. We'll get a negative value. And that's not what we want to have because when we say that it's a voltaic cell, it's supposed to be a positive value. So we're not going to use this equation. We're going to use the second one. Okay, let's go back now and look at our chart of reduction potentials. Now, I realize this thing's really hard to read, so you'll probably want to look at it uh, over in uh, Blackboard so that you can see it better. But here's a couple things we want to point out that whatever has the most positive value, in this case, can't really read it very well, but it's positive 3.87. Whatever has the most positive value in our table is going to be the strongest oxidizing agent, and that is fluorine gas. And likewise, if I move this down a little bit, whatever has the most negative value. So this is negative three point, I can't read it, 3.05. Whatever is the most negative is going to be the strongest reducing agent. So that's for lithium. So on our table here, the strongest oxidizing agent is fluorine. Our strongest reducing agent is lithium. So you could take the potentials for, say, you know, three or four of these reactions, and you could rank those 
in their values going from positive to negative. And you can say over on the negative side, that's the strongest reducing agent out of the list. And whatever's on the left side, whatever's more positive, is going to be the strongest oxidizing agent. So you see how you can relate how positive it is and how negative it is to what makes a better oxidizing agent, what makes a better reducing agent. Now, one more thing I want you to get off of this slide, and that is what is in the middle. And what is in the middle is hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. Oh, I don't want to do that. I'm not, I'm not going to write out. But you guys, I think you can hear me. This is hydrogen peroxide. It can go either way. Because it's in sort of the middle of the table, it can be either an oxidizing agent, so it can cause something to lose electrons, or it can be a reducing agent. In other words, it can give electrons to some other substance. So it can go either way. It can be an oxidizer or it can be a reducer. Now we're going to need to go to this next slide and work through it, but I think it's getting, I think we've been at this for a while. So what I'm going to do is ask, is there a question up to this slide that anybody has? I haven't been hearing much out of you guys. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. If you do have something that you need, you know, before Friday, please uh, send me an email or a text message. Email's better because I got a record of what you, what you asked me about. But anyway, uh, please contact me if you need something. Uh, if you are having any issues with sampling or with uh, submitting lab reports, I do need to know that. So. But otherwise, I'm just going to ask you guys to please be safe, please be careful, and I hope that everybody's, you know, okay and well. So, anyway, you guys have a good day. Take care.